love this. You're going to see me very, very excited as I always am, but very excited tonight preaching on this because I love talking about Christian doctrine. I love talking about the essentials of the faith. And tonight absolutely is going to be some essential doctrine and some stuff that you probably didn't know. And it'll just be a learning moment and eye opening and people will get saved, Lord willing and delivered and healed. So chapter three and four, we went over last week. I'll go over recap of chapter three there's nothing in the world system that can stop the faithfulness of god jew or gentile the law or with your conscience we're all guilty we all deserve condemnation whether you're a jew and you have the law or whether you're a gentile and you have a conscience we're all guilty before god there's none of us that are righteous no one seeks god no one loves god no one cares for god we're all sinners in need of a savior and the law's purpose was to silence us before god it brings the knowledge that we need salvation. That's what the law does. It shows us where we're in sin, where we're in error, and it makes us cry out saying, we need someone to save us. Jesus was God's propitiation. This means that God's justice was fully satisfied by the blood of Jesus. Christ's death is our greatest proof of our need for righteousness. God's way, the only way that God has for sinners to be declared righteous is through the person of Jesus Christ, through the shed blood of Jesus. And then at the end of chapter three, Paul says that we have no room to boast because it's only by faith that we're saved. Uh, none of us deserves this. So we don't earn this. You can't get salvation by doing something. It is by the grace of God. Chapter four, Paul po pointed out to the Roman Christians that Abraham's faith was what was credited to him as righteousness, not his circumcision or his observance to the law. So it wasn't an act that gets us saved. It's not a ritual. It's not circumcision. It's not baptism. It's not an act that we do to respond to scripture. It's faith in Jesus. That's what counts us as righteous before God. Nothing else counts us as righteous but faith in Jesus. So he has to argue with these or really debate these believers in Rome because they thought if I'm circumcised, if I obey the law, and he's like, no, Abraham was not counted righteous for his for obeying the law or for being circumcised he was counted righteous for of his faith and then again paul says wages are not a gift if a person does something they deserve it but grace is something we can't earn it's free and so it's not a gift if we have to earn salvation faith in grace forgiveness and justification all explain the vastness of god's love and god's matchless plan okay so that was chapters three and four which leads us into chapter five and i want you to see the theme here that paul continues to bring out the grace of God is beyond what we can comprehend or begin to understand. All that has been done through Christ was done by the grace of God. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not do whatever you want, which we're going to talk about tonight. The grace of God is a free gift that Christ willingly died for us and imputes his righteousness onto us freely. Again, we can't earn it. It's not by works. It's not by the law. It was a free gift. We work now, works do matter. We do work after receiving the truth because we're grateful for what God has done. It's our response to work for him and let his spirit work through us. So once we receive salvation by faith, putting our trust in Jesus, then fruit begins to grow on our trees. We begin to put work in. Now, the, the reason why James says, if you say you have faith, but you have no works, your faith is dead and you don't truly have faith is because works is evidence of salvation, not way, a way of attaining salvation. So we don't gain it by works. We prove we've received it by works. It's a, it's a response to having received the grace of God and received the mercy of God. It makes us want to work. Romans, all right? So if you're following, we are in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, okay? And we're going to really dive into this deep tonight and go over exactly what Paul is saying. Therefore, having been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So Paul in chapter five, verse one begins with therefore, and Paul is saying therefore to remind us of the journey from chapters one through four, where Paul mapped out God's freedom from sin and the gift of righteousness. And Paul tells us none of us are good. So Paul's convincing us that we're not righteous, that in chapters one and two, God has turned us over to a reprobate mind, that we followed sinfulness and lust and the pleasures of our own desires that we've been enticed by. And then Paul starts chapter five by therefore, and Paul begins to describe because he thinks, he thinks by this point, we should have an understanding of justification by faith. And this is what Paul says, because we are justified by faith, we are now at peace with God, washed continually in grace. No longer are we God's enemies. We are God's friends, just like Abraham was a friend of God. No longer should we fear the wrath of God, but now we look to the blessings of God. Jesus has introduced us to his father and the father loves us. And because we are completely justified by faith in Jesus, 
We can look forward to a time where we'll be full in the full glory and the presence of Almighty God. We have hope. This is what Paul is saying. No matter what happens here on this earth, we know that everything is going to turn out in the end because we put our hope in Jesus, friend. In the end, we win and we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. No matter what you're going through right now, I want to tell you that storms don't last forever, that there will be a rainbow at the end of the rain, that there is going to be dry ground, and there's hope for you that one day you are going to be in the glory of God. No matter what suffering, what trial you're going through, in the end, at the end of the day, we win. And so Paul says, therefore, understand that we've been washed in this grace, that we have access to God, that we have peace with God, that we're no longer at war with God. This is what he says, three elements in this verse that give us a reason to rejoice. Paul's going to show us three things in this verse. Number one is justification. Second is peace and then access to God. This is why Paul says that we rejoice. We've been justified. The price has been paid in full. That's a reason to praise for justification with God. We're now in right standing with God. Number two, we have peace with God that before we were saved, we were at war. Our carnal flesh, our nature is at war with God. How many know you don't want to be at war with God? Those that are not saved right now, they war against God. They war against God's law and they war against God's plan. But, but through Jesus, we're justified. We get peace with God. So no longer, that's a good word. Are you at war with God? And then number three, Paul says, here's a good reason to rejoice. You have access to God. I mean, think about this. There's many of you watching this that you're like, if I could only be Isaiah Saldivar's friend and if I could only have his phone number. I mean, imagine if you could at any time call me, text me, and me and you were the closest there ever was. You'd say, man, that's great. I have access to Isaiah Saldivar. Like I could access him at any time if I need prayer, if I want to hang out, if I want to be his friend, I have full access. But we have an infinitely greater truth and an infinitely greater benefit than being friends with your favorite preacher, whoever you watch online or whoever you look up to, whatever celebrity you might look up to. And that's this. We have access to God. God has given us his phone number. He's given us his address. And he said, anytime you want to hang out and get together, I'm available. I'm in the prayer closet. I'm in the secret place. And you have direct access. Like you imagine that more than me, more than getting to meet me or call me or text me or whatever, you have access to Jesus. Be excited about that. Be happy about that. Paul says, rejoice in this, that we have justification, peace with God, and access to God. That's a good word. Thank you, Jesus. We have access to you. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, oh, I love this. I love this. Paul says, and not only that, guess what? It's about to get better. He says, and not only that in verse 3. But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Man, there's so much in this text here. Paul says this, you think justification is good? You think peace with God is good? You think access to God is good? He goes, hold on, there's more. And here's, here's the more, here's the other benefit. We get to rejoice in suffering. That's the glory of it. We glory in tribulations, Paul says. Notice that he doesn't say we, re we rejoice at our sufferings. Now, we don't like to suffer. How many of you like to suffer? Nobody does. Nobody likes to suffer, so we don't rejoice at our suffering, and we shouldn't rejoice at our suffering. He says we rejoice in suffering. We glory in tribulations. So it's not that we're like, thank you, Lord. I'm so happy that everyone hates me. I'm getting tortured. I'm getting beat and I'm getting lost my job for the gospel. It's not that you rejoice at the suffering. It's you rejoice in the suffering. He goes, this is the benefit. And it sounds like a weird benefit, but he says, here's the benefit in the suffering that you go through. There is purpose and there is meaning. Our sufferings, and somebody needs to hear this tonight because you're going through suffering. Our sufferings lead to something. It's leading us somewhere. Paul says the suffering is leading us and producing perseverance. And perseverance is the ability to continue onward in the face of hard times. So when you're going through struggles, you don't give up. Come on, somebody hear me tonight. You don't get weary. You don't get weak. You don't throw in the towel. You don't say, God, you must have missed it because you've let me go through this. He says, no, in the suffering, you persevere. You keep pushing onwards. And if we are persevering people, then we don't quit. We push forward. This is the devil's goal. The devil can't steal your, your salvation. He can't rob you of what God has. For you. He can't do much. But what he can try to do is get you to give up, is get you to quit. And I want to tell you, don't throw in the towel. You need to persevere. I know I'm talking to some of you because you're typing it in the chat that I'm talking to you. But you need to push through 
because there is a light at the end of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel lives on the inside of you. There is a rainbow after the 40 days of rain. God's power, God's presence is made perfect in our weakness. Paul said, I prayed that the Lord would take this, this thorn from me. I prayed three times. I kept praying and praying. And God says, I'm not taking this tribulation from you, Paul, because the weaker you get, the stronger I get. And my strength is perfect in your weakness. If I don't have sound, just refresh it because everyone else is good and I see sound coming through. For those of you that don't have sound, just refresh it. So as you're going through it, God, you're building something. Paul then says, perseverance produces character. By facing trials and working through them, I'm preaching to myself, God is molding you to be a better person. It is only through trials and tribulations. That is why, I'm just going to say this, if you spoil your kids, if you were raised with a friend or a family member that was really spoiled, they never went through trials, they never got disciplined, they never went through any persecution, they had an easy life where everything was handed to them. Come on, Chad, don't act like I'm preaching. My, their character is usually not the best character they're usually stingy they're they're bitter they're they have uh, an entitlement attitude and they're usually not the nicest people in the world because they never had trials tribulations or suffering to produce character or perseverance in them so these these things we're going through they are producing character the trials that we're facing are doing something think about all the times you went through a hard time and you came out of those hard times better you didn't come out bitter you came out better because God was molding you through the trial. So this is literally a benefit. Justification, peace with God, and access to God, and glory and tribulations. That's an added benefit. So now that you know, anytime you go through something, God is building something. And we know just as God brought us from our past trials, God is gonna bring us through our present trials, amen. And God is gonna bring us through future trials. Why? Because he loves us, that's why. That's God's motivation. And it's hard to see now because you're suffering, but someday you're going to look back and say, thank God that I went through that. If it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Thank you, Lord, that you let that opportunity not go through. Thank you, Lord, that you let that door slam shut. Thank you, Lord, that that relationship didn't work out. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't rescue me from that situation I prayed to get out of. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me needy, for keeping me weak, for keeping me broken so that I can be needy to you, for you, so I can lean on you. There's a perseverance. So whatever you're going through, and we're all going through something, you are in good hands because God is building in your mess. God is building in your trial, in your circumstances, in your suffering. The idea that God will not let us suffer is anti-biblical. I know for many of you, whenever I said that I'm no longer pre-tribulation rapture, I do believe to this point right now, um, and that I do believe 100% that we will go through tribulation. People are so mad. How could God allow us to go through tribulation? Well, Paul says right here, we glory in tribulation. Like literally, we glory in tribulation. The same way right now, there's people being murdered for their faith as I preach in my air-conditioned uh, studio. There's people being murdered for their faith and God is allowing it. God has always allowed tribulation. The only gospel that says God won't allow you to suffer and God won't allow you to go through anything is the American gospel. And by the way, the American gospel is not in the Bible. So that is not a biblical gospel. God will allow us because suffering produces growth. The martyr's blood grew the early church. The church has always been grown on the blood of martyrs. And the churches that thrive today are the churches that are underground in China, that are churches in persecuted areas of Africa and in India. These are where the churches are thriving and growing more. But we have a country club coffee and donut church in America that says God does not want you to suffer when in reality suffering produces growth. And even if you look at the book of Revelation, there are martyrs that are under the throne of under the altar of God, crying out for God to avenge their blood and God allows them to be martyred. God has allowed this stuff. And Paul is not. Listen, you might be reading this saying, Paul, how could you say that? Paul is accustomed to suffering. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11. From the Jews, five times I received 49 stripes minus one. From the Jews, five times I received 39 lashes. That's verse 24 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A, a night and day in the deep. In peril in waters, in peril of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in the perils of the sea. This is Paul speaking. He says, I've been in peril of false brethren, in weariness, in toil. Paul says, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, 
and cold and nakedness. This is Paul, what he went through. He goes, I was hungry. I was homeless. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was fasting. I was cold. I was naked. I had 39 lashes five times. I've been stoned. I've been beat with rods three times. I've been shipwrecked three times. I've been in peril by my countrymen, my family, by robbers, by Gentiles, by wilderness, by sea. Paul went through everything. I mean, literally everything. And so you're in good hands. It's producing something in you. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is what Paul is saying. We were completely powerless to do what was right when Jesus died for us. And he says, few if any, will die for a good man, though some might die for a good man. God's love, however, is so gracious that God didn't die for good people. He says God died for us while we were sinners. He didn't wait for us to clean it and get our act together. He dies for the ungodly. And I'm fascinated by the mystery of the love of God that while we were angry sinners, he decides to give his life for us. He didn't say, I'll wait for them to get it together. He says, I'll die now while they are sinners. And we have to understand, I'm sorry, we don't understand this kind of love. In our culture, we love for a reason. We love with a reason. I love you because of this. I love you because you're this way, or you could do this, or you can't do this, or you do this, or your personality. We love with a reason. We love with a purpose. That's the, the rational sense of love. But God says, I love you, and that's it. That's it. There's no reason for it. It's no strings attached. It's inexplainable. It's unfathomable. It's so different than any love we've ever experienced it before. And our reaction is to serve God. There's no reason, he says, for, for me to love you. I love you because I love you. That's why it's no strings attached. Romans 8.35 says, can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or we're persecuted or we're hungry, destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. So he says, listen, if you're going through hunger, persecution, destitution, danger, threatened with your life, it's not God saying, not God's love isn't disconnected. God doesn't stop loving us. It doesn't separate us. But the love of God is eternal and it's unexplainable. And there's no reason for the love of God. It's a great mystery. It really is. I think a billion years will go by in eternity and we'll still not understand the mystery of the love of God, which is this. Christ died for us while we were sinners. And now, would you die for a good person? Maybe, Paul says, maybe. If someone's good, you might die for them. That's That might happen. But he says, but we're bad and God decides to die for us. How much greater is that? Romans 5, 9 through 11. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive the reconciliation. So this is what Paul's saying. While we were busy rejecting God, hating God, cursing at God, following our own path, he was busy reconciling us back to himself through his son. So you're busy in rebellion. He's busy reconciling you back to himself. And Paul asks a simple question here. If while we were enemies, Christ died for us, how much better will he treat us now that we're his sons and daughters? Think about that. If he died for us while we're his enemies, now we're his friends, how much more will he love us, care for us, and give us what we need according to his will? If God helps his enemies, Paul is saying, of course God's going to help you. You've been reconciled back to God. The work has been done. You have peace with God. You've been reconnected. There's no more war with God. There's no more wrath. We are eternally at peace with God through Christ. Now that we're sons and daughters, God's going to treat you well. Like if, if you just logically think about if God did all this for me while I was his enemy, while I hated him, have you thought about this? How much more now? I mean, I don't understand how some of you in the chat are Christian and you're like, I just don't think God loves me. God is withholding. God doesn't want to do this for me. God doesn't want to do that for me. And God's like, what are you talking about? I gave the most costly sacrifice ever by sending my own son when you didn't even like me when you hated me when you were shaking your fist and cursing me out that's when i said yes to dying on the cross and now because now that you're my son and daughter my friend now that i'm your master you think i'm not gonna love you you think i'm not gonna treat you well you think i'm not gonna do everything that i can for you no this is what paul is saying He goes, now that you've been reconciled, God, of course, is going to take care of you. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Therefore, 
just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin for until the law sin was in the world but sin was not imputed when there is no law nevertheless death reigned from adam to moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of adam who is a type of him who was to come so this was him paul saying there's no sin in the garden it's a perfect environment environment adam and eve are free to live in perfect happiness they had fellowship with god and each other they were capable of perfect obedience and we don't know how long they enjoyed this but we know that they gave in to the devil they gave into the snake and they listened to what the devil said to them they obeyed satan changing masters and paul explains the sequence of events that leads up to this this historical event where adam and eve sinned and death both physical and spiritual became part of our human existence this is also referred to as original sin that sin that adam committed was considered original sin the very first sin and paul says this because of it death spread to all men because all sinned this means that from birth we're separated from god we're not born righteous we're born separated from god and the bible says death spread to all men because one man sinned think about how crazy that, that is the entrance of sin into life was created from one person's desire to disobey god now of course you sinning doesn't have as much implication as adam sin did but there are implications to our sin sin is not a game sin is not a joke and one man's sin brought death and that death spread throughout all of the human race romans 5 15 through 17 but the free gift is not like the offense for if by the one man's offense many died much more the grace of the grace of god and the gift of grace of the one man jesus christ abounded to many and the gift is not like that which came from the one who sinned so he said the judgment which came from one from one offense one person resulted in condemnation but the free gift came from jesus christ resulted in justification for if by one man's offense death came by the other man's obedience righteousness came to man and justification so this was why the bible says jesus was the last adam or the last lamb because adam brought sin jesus came as a sacrifice for our sin and was the last lamb of god again one man sin came one man righteousness came jesus came and reversed the curse to put it simply paul is basically saying god's grace is bigger than sin and the final result of the grace is far beyond the result of sin so the grace of god why the bible says it's greater than sin and it abounds even greater it sin abounded to many but the grace abounds even greater is that the grace of god has more power than the result of sin paul is showing that the sin of one man brought condemnation but god's grace is sufficient to overcome the sin of mankind which was what came into the world sin destroys lives grace helps us to live a full life jesus said the thief comes to still kill and destroy but i've come to bring life and life more abundantly so this is paul contrasting the difference between what sin did and what the grace of god does and then paul says in romans 5 18 through 21 therefore as through one man's offense judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation even so through one man's righteous act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounded grace abounded much more so that sin so that as sin reigned in death even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through christ jesus our lord so Paul's concluding statement in Romans chapter 5 is the nature of the fall and how the fall brought condemnation upon the human race and that one man's sin brought everyone to be con condemned. The law entered that offense might abound. What he's saying by that is we see what's right and we discover that we're wrong. The law helps us to discover that we were wrong. That's what Paul is saying. Um, the law entered that offense might abound. So the law shows us our offense and we're now abound in our offense because we see our sin rightfully we discover that we're wrong and we need the grace of god every single one of you watching there's some that say i don't need this brother this isn't for me i'm already a christian i don't need the grace of god every single one of us on the daily basis we need the grace of god for we've all fallen short and we all fall short and god says i want to change your nature i want you to be a new species you need the grace of god today you need the grace of god his mercies are new every single morning the bible says like type that in the chat right now i need the grace of god i need the mercy of god to live the life that god has called me to live so by him contrasting this paul is saying that grace is stronger than the sin that abounded is a sin abounding in the culture in humanity yes but the grace of god is even stronger okay let's recap 
Being justified by faith brings peace, access to God, hope for heaven, and a purpose in our suffering. Christ dies for us while we're sinners, which is the unmistakable proof of God's love. How does God prove he loves us? We're going to show you this later as well, is that Christ dies for us while we're sinners. That's the proof of the love of God. If Christ loved us when we were sinners, Paul says, how much more will he love us now that we've become his own? God knew that sin would enter the world, but he had a plan, Christ Jesus, to come and give us the great and give us grace. And then lastly, Paul talks about the law that showed us clearly what righteousness is so that we can see clearly how bad our sin is and grace being bigger than sin. That's what the Bible describes as where there's grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds greater. Okay, chapter six. Remember, these are not, let me take a drink of water here. These are not separated by chapter and verses in the original text. So imagine chapter six is not broken up the way we're breaking it up. We just go directly into chapter six, verses one through two. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So Paul says where sin abounds, grace abounds even greater. And the question someone might have is, well, then maybe I should keep sinning so I could experience the grace of God at a higher level because if I where there's sin, there's greater grace. So the more sin in my life, the more grace there's going to be, which is what a lot of people live. A lot of Christians think because this loose American gospel I can sin all I want and the grace of God will keep covering me over and over and over again. But Paul says this, this is Paul's response. Certainly not. How should you who died in sin live any longer in it? Paul is asking the question, how do you keep sinning? If you've died to it and died in it and died from, you're separated from sin, how can you keep living in it? You're dead to sin. Sin is no longer your master. It no longer controls you. It no longer steers your life. And now it's possible to live your life sinless, washed by the blood of Jesus, following Jesus. You know, the Bible says, if you can control your tongue, you can be perfect. That's what the Bible says. Now, it's not that anyone is ever but Jesus. Of course, Jesus was perfect. I don't believe anybody in the history of the world has ever been perfect except for Jesus. That's my personal belief. But I do believe, according to Scripture, if you could control your tongue, you can live a sinless life. And Paul says, how should we who died in sin live any longer in it? The righteousness of God is so powerful, it grants the believer's power to live a life where you no longer want to sin. You no longer, think about this, desire the sins that you once craved. I used to crave sexual sin. I used to crave pornography. I used to crave alcohol. I used to talk dirty. Every other word being the F word out of dirty mouth. I craved my flesh, my sinful man, craved the desires of my flesh and the desires of this world. And now when God saves me, I become a new creature. I no longer crave those sinful things. I don't desire the things that I once craved. I desire things of holiness, things of righteousness, things of God. So this is all about what Paul is saying here. This is all about your nature changing, your appetite changing. How many of you know an animal has a different appetite than a human? A dog will vomit. I know it sounds gross, but a dog will vomit and then a dog will go and eat its vomit 10 minutes later. That's disgusting. The dog has a different appetite. The Bible says one that's in sin is like the man that is like a dog that returns to its vomit or a washed pig returns to the mud. But the Bible says that we've become a new species. We've become a new creature that you don't crave the things you used to crave. You don't go after the things that you used to go after. You don't desire the old dreams, ambitions, motives, pleasures, vices, addictions. Come on, are you a new creature? You don't go back like, and it's gross. Some of you in the chat like, oh, that's so gross. It is disgusting. But that's exactly what we do when we go back to our sin. That's exactly what we do when we go back to our vomit. The Bible says when you, a fool that returns to his folly, a fool that returns to his sin is like a dog that goes and eats his vomit. It's disgusting. So why do we keep doing it? Why do we live our lives? Is it possible that we've never truly been born again? Is it possible that we're living our life separated from what God really designed us to live? The power of the Holy Spirit that changes us, that changes our nature, that it goes beyond just praying the sinner's prayer and going to church on Sunday, but you have actually fruit worthy of repentance that your tree bears fruit and there's real evidence that that seed lands on the good soil. And we don't just say, oh, you're a Christian because you prayed a prayer. But no, now that the fruit's growing, I can say, oh, look, that person's a Christian. The Bible says that the same way you can identify a, a, a tree by its fruit, so you can identify a person by their actions. You can tell that person's a believer. That person's a Christian. You can tell by their 
actions. So don't get up here and say, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And Paul says, but you're still living in the same sin. You're still living something you're supposed to be dead to. Should you just keep sinning like that? No, no, you can't just keep on going how you want. You need to ask God to give you a new nature. You need to be born again. The power of God is so powerful, it changes our desires. Romans 6, 3 through 4. Oh, do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Let me say this again because it could get complicating. I'm going to make it very basic here. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, this is what happened to you, and this is so good. Listen, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So Paul does use some difficult language here. And the question would be, what does it mean to be baptized into Christ Jesus? This is not water baptism Paul's talking about. What Paul is saying, we would think of water baptism, but Paul's not using water baptism. He's using the word in a different way. He's using baptism as a metaphor for when one person is united with another person or with other people. So to be baptized to somebody is to be united like this. You're you're united with that person like a a tree branch grows. There's a uniting that happens there. So remember, and I'll show you this, when God used Moses to part the Red Sea and the Israelites were saved, 1 Corinthians 10.2 says this, Paul refers to this event by saying the Israelites were baptized into Moses, okay? So this is what your Bible says, the Israelites were baptized into Moses, which is to say that they were united to Moses like never before. They recognized his leadership, they depended on him, and in the same way, were baptized into Christ Jesus. Many people, well, not many, but there's some speculation that in Acts 2.38, when Paul, Paul, Peter said be baptized, he didn't mean get water baptized, although we should all be water baptized, but he actually was saying be baptized in Christ Jesus because to be baptized into someone, what Paul is saying here, be baptized in Christ Jesus, is to be unified or connected with them just like the Israelites were baptized into Moses. So some say Paul wasn't, I'm sorry, Peter wasn't talking about being water baptized when he was saying be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Peter was actually talking about being baptized into Jesus, being united with Christ following Jesus, which again, there's a big debate on that. I don't want to get into that, but right here, Paul is definitely not talking about water baptism. He's talking about baptized into Christ Jesus. So that's us being united to Jesus and our identity and Jesus's identity are being inseparable and us being linked together with him. And that's why Paul says we are baptized into his death. Baptism into his death, Romans 6, 3. What he means is that we're so united with Christ that his death on the cross becomes our death, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. In other words, Christ's death was the death of our sin. When Christ died as our sin for our sin, our sin also died and we were baptized in death with Christ. It was the death of our old relationship with Adam and the essence was that was was sin. So the old union we had with Adam, because we're humans, has now died and we've died with Christ and we've been also not only that resurrected with him. I know some of it can seem complicated. I'm trying to keep it very simple. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So the the strength of Paul's argument here is united. We're united in the death of Christ. We're also united, not just in the death, but in the resurrection. To be united means to be planted together in the Greek. And Paul is suggesting that through the death and resurrection, we've become one, grafted together the same plant with Christ. You know, you talk about the vine dresser and the branches and Jesus says, you're the branches and you need to bear fruit. You're connected to the vine. We're grafted with Jesus into Jesus like a plant is grafted in. And I'm going to show you another place where Paul talks about this. But as taught in verse four, we are buried by baptism only with the intention of rising again. So we're not just baptized into his death, but we rise again. We share in the resurrection power of Christ and newness of life. So the formulation goes like this. The man who participates in the death of Christ also participates in the resurrection of Christ. There's a lot of Christians that they just die with Christ. They lay down their old life. They go into that tomb, but they're never resurrected in Christ. They're never made into that new person. But Jesus says, I don't just want you to die to self. I want you to be resurrected in the newness of life. I want you to be washed and I want you to be made new. And I want you to rise with me. He gives us this opportunity to be resurrected in Christ, resurrected with Christ, just like you die with him. You're resurrected with him. Romans 6, oh, I already read Romans 6, 5. Paul illustrates this in in chapter 11 of Romans when he writes this. I quote Paul, some of the branches were broken off and you, 
being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the feet fatness of the olive tree. So in chapter Romans 11, Paul says, you are branches that were broken off, but you are grafted in. And this is a, a principle we go throughout scripture where we are grafted into the body of Christ that we're grafted into what Christ did on the cross and the family of God. A Bible scholar wrote this about, about this text this is what he said. It is the Holy Spirit, not water, who joins a person to Christ. Let me say that again. It is the Holy Spirit, not water, who joins a person to Christ. This is the dynamic work of the gospel. Water is an outward sign practiced as an ordinance or sacrament of one's profession of faith. This has been a doctrine in the church since its conception. When an adult Christian decides to be baptized, it is not a work of righteousness, rather, or should be, a response to a God who loved them and was willing to take on their sin. So he's saying baptism is a sign of you saying, I'm committing my life to Jesus as a profession of faith, and it's been around since the inception of the church, and it's a response to the love of God saying, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna serve you, and I'm gonna be baptized in death and in resurrection. Baptism is all, and also an act of Christian obedience. It is our affirmation that we believed and we wanna follow in Christ's footsteps. But remember, as we've said before, it is the Holy Spirit that regenerates the human spirit, not an act of baptism. Okay, you can go baptize anybody, whether they're sincere or not. Unsincere people are not regenerated through the act of baptism. We're regenerated through the act of putting our faith in Jesus. This is what Paul has been trying to get through to us. It is not any type of work that we can do. It is faith in Christ alone. That is why how we get imputed righteousness. That is what makes us righteous. Again, not circumcision, not obeying the law, not water baptism, not praying enough, not reading enough, not fasting enough. It is faith in Jesus that counts us as righteous, just like Abraham's faith counted him as righteous. It's the same thing. Romans 6, 6 through 7. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So Paul says we are joined together with Christ. Our old man was crucified with him, so our body of sin has been done away with. Friend, maybe you didn't know this. When you become a Christian, your sinful body, the body that, that craves, that desires that sin, God says, I've done away with that. That, that body has died with Christ, and you've become a new creature in Christ. And here's the kicker. We should no longer be slaves to sin. That's what Paul is saying. We should no longer, who's spamming here? You're getting banned. I had to block that person on Facebook. They're spamming the chat. We should no longer be slaves to sin because we've died and we've been freed from sin. That is a beautiful thing. Write that in the chat. I have been freed from sin. This is the crucified life that you've died to your sinful desires with Christ. It's hard to convince ourselves of this, I know, because there's sin around us. We feel like, man, there's sin in us, but you have to understand this is by faith that we take on the new nature. We can't wait until God says, all right, this has happened. We have to have faith that we are in Christ. We've been born again. We are a new creature. We don't live our lives. Some of us walk around living our lives. I'm just a slave of sin. I'm always gonna sin. I'm always gonna lust. I'm always going to be addicted to porn. I'm always going to be an alcoholic. I'm always going to be addicted to nicotine. I'm always going to be in rebellion. I'm always going to lie. I'm always going to cheat. Always, always, always. We have the sin mentality when the Bible says, no, you're not. You have a new nature. Now, if you sin on accident, then you cry out to Abba Father, say, Lord, forgive me. I repent. But you have to understand your nature, the essence of who you are, your species. You're not a dog anymore. You're a new creature. You don't crave the desires of the flesh. Now, if you do, you need to repent. You need to say, Lord, I put my trust in you, my faith in you. I need to repent. I need to turn from my ways. And you need to stop saying, I've been born again when you're living your life a slave to sin. So the crucified life, you've died to your sinful desires with Christ. And now you can live your life free from the appetite and the desire to do sinful things. I've had many pastors I've heard preach say, we all lust. We all deal with lust. And my response is, I don't. Like really, guys. I'm not checking out women. I'm not struggling and fighting pornography and sitting there going, oh, I just don't want to look at that or I, uh, I'm struggling to not cheat on my wife. God has freed me from the power of lust. God delivered me. I was that way in my old nature and then I was born again into a new nature. So there is an ability to walk in holiness and freedom from this lust of the flesh and from these things that many pastors say, we all deal with it. Just because you're dealing with it, don't say everybody does. When Jesus right here says, or Paul says right here, that we've died with Christ and there is freedom. Romans 6, and I know some of you are mad about this, but take it up with the Bible because I'm literally giving you verse for verse. Romans 6, 8 through 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died 
to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So Paul begins to bring a series of three active verbs we can think of as three steps to overcoming sin. The first verb is to know. Paul says, knowing that Jesus rose from the dead, he cannot die again, and therefore death has no mastery over him. This is the first step to overcoming sin, knowing that Christ died to sin and lives for God. So when I know Christ died for sin, Christ died as sin, then I can know that I could live a sinful life as well. I could live a life free from the power of sin. I know when I say a sinless life, everybody starts manifesting, oh brother, you can't live sinless, which go to your research, okay? But let's just say a life free from the power of sin. Let's not say sinless just for the sake of um, practicality, but let's say a life free from the powers of sin, of having to give in to the cravings of our sinful nature. So that's step one, knowing that Christ died as our sin and for our sin. And then he gives us step two and three in Romans 6, 11 through 14, okay? Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not, listen to what Paul says here, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. Let me say that again for those of you sitting in the back. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So either Paul is lying, he was not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and this is not the word of God, or your theology that you're always going to live under the power of sin and dominion is wrong. And my conclusion is this, you're wrong, not the Apostle Paul. Paul is 100% correct, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. You are under the grace of God, so you no longer are bound to that sinful nature. So here's the second and third steps to overcoming sin. In the same way we know death has no mastery over Jesus, we ought to take it true that we're no longer slaves to sin because we are joined with Christ in death through the power of the Holy Spirit. So death has no power over Christ, we're joined with them, sin has no power over us. The King James uses the verb reckon, we ought to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Paul is saying, make up your mind, make up your mind that sin has no power over you. No longer am I giving in, it has no power over me. The third and final step is to yield to God. So you make up your mind, sin has no power over me, and then you yield to God. He's saying, don't offer your bodies to sin anymore. Offer them to God. Now, it's not a matter of sitting on the couch and doing nothing all day. It's a matter of doing the right thing. So I'm not going to give my body to sin. Sin wants my body. It wants me to do sinful things. We know, of course, demons want us to do sinful things and they want to use our body. But Paul says, present your body no longer as slaves in righteousness, but slaves as righteousness. Jesus is both our example of a life that is fully surrendered to the will of God and one who enables us to walk in the same surrender. It is our faith that makes us have, the, gives us the ability to live this life. Faith overrides our will. It, it gives us the ability to live in the will of God. So if you think you can't live this, you need to have faith that if Jesus did this for us, this is a blessing for me. It's my inheritance. I can live this way. Paul reminded the Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap, will, to, of the flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows of the spirit will reap everlasting life. So Paul says this, don't think you get away with things, but the reality is you're not getting away with it just because you're not getting caught, but you're sowing something and there are consequences to your sin, which we know we talked about in Romans chapter one through three. Paul says this, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Your body fights, your flesh fights against walking with God. It doesn't want to be in submission to God. The Bible says that the, the, your flesh, your mind is at war. There's enmity between you and God. And so you have to keep putting yourself into submission to the will of God. Crucify the flesh. Use the will that God has given you to say yes to God and to say no to sin. You have the right to choose what you look at, what you do, what you touch, what you listen to. Stop acting like the devil's making you and crucify your flesh and present your bodies to God. And I'm telling you, as you put your faith in God, as you do that, God will wash you, God will cleanse you, God will deliver you from that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is an amazing, amazing man of God, said this, baptismal death means justification from sin. 
The sinner must die so that he may be delivered from his sin. Sin has no more further claim on him for death, death's demand has been met and its account settled. Justification from sin can only happen through death. Forgiveness of sin does not mean that the sin is overlooked and forgotten. It means a, de a real death on the part of the sinner and separation from sin. So the way that we're forgiven is we've died to that thing. It's no longer us. We've died to that. We are new creatures in Christ. Christ. That's what Paul is saying in this seemingly complicated analogies he's using. Basically, you died with Christ and you're no longer a slave to sin. Romans, we're almost done here. Romans 16, 15 through 18. What then? He says this. Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. But but God be thanked that though you are slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So Paul wants us to understand that being under grace does not lessen the demand of the law, but actually grace is more demanding. Remember, Jesus said if you commit the Bible, the law says if you commit adultery, you're guilty. Jesus said if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So the story, the story of grace doesn't lower the standard, but actually hires the standard because it's only by grace and the Spirit of God that we can live the standard that grace gives us. So it's not like a lowered standard. In the Roman Empire, people became slaves a number of different ways. You could have been born into a slave family. You could have been captured in battle. You could have been forced into slavery because your nation was taken over. Or the last way was free people would go into a house and they would clean and, out and do the things and act like a slave. They voluntarily became slaves. Whether they wanted to live there, whether they didn't have a purpose, people voluntarily became slaves. If under Roman rule, if a person did this, he or she was a slave. The idea was a man does, a man is as he does. And Paul says, listen, if you act as a slave by doing sinful things, you are a slave to sin. So don't say you're not a slave when you keep doing the things that slaves do and going back to that sinful nature. But if you act as a slave to God by doing good things, you are a slave to God. Now note, there's only two options slavery to sin or slavery to God. These are the two options that Paul gives us. There's no such thing as not having a master. We all have a master. And the question is tonight, who's our master? Are we mastered by death and we're slaves to, to death and sin? Or are we mastered by God and we're slaves of God and righteousness? Because you can't be both. Now, don't say you're a slave of God if you're actually a slave to sin because you're just lying. You're actually a slave to sin. This is what he's saying. Our struggle is not with the law, nor with grace. Our struggle is with sin. Remember, the law brings our sin to the light and the grace leads us to the cross where sin can be done away with. As believers, we've changed masters. We were once slaves to sin, finding no way out, but now we're servants of righteousness. And Paul states this, you became slaves of righteousness. Now imagine being a slave for 10 years, okay? 10 years you're working for the master, you're doing everything they say, you have no right of your own, you're working 12, 14 hours a day, and you just have no free will, and one day somebody comes and sets you free, and the master says, listen, your wages have been paid, you're free to go. You don't have to work anymore, you don't have to work 15 hours, 16 hours a day, you can freely go, you have your own free will, and then the next day comes, and you knock on the door, trying to go back to work. And the, the master says, You've already been free. Somebody paid the price for you and you don't have to keep coming back doing the things you used to do and working so hard and breaking your back, you're free to go. But you keep coming back to the master even though you've already been set free. That's exactly what we do when we keep sinning. Paul's going like, why do you keep going back to it? You've been set free from sin and you no longer have to sin, but you keep going back to it even though Christ has paid the price to set you free. You look so dumb doing that. And for many of us, we look dumb always going back to our sin. Romans 6, 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Paul saying, I speak in human terms is basically saying, I'm using slavery as an analogy because you're familiar with slavery. Slavery was a very big and effective during this time in Rome, in first century Rome. A large percentage of teachers, doctors were slaves. Um, everybody knew what slavery was. Everybody understood slavery. So he's using it in human terms to explain our relationship to sin and our relationship to God. Romans 6, 20 through 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
but now having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul says, here's what sin offers. Slavery to uncleanliness, ever increasing lawlessness, slavery to sin, shame, and death. That's what sin gets. If you want to be a slave to sin, you want sin to be your master, this is what you're going to get from sin. He says, but when you're a slave of God, you get holiness and you get eternal life. That's what you get as a slave of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There is a price to pay. There's wages. One day you will have to pay. Listen to me, please, everybody in the chat. One day you're going to have to pay. The world thinks that sin is free. But understand that as you're sinning, there's a tab. There's an eternal tab being ran up. And there's going to come a day where you stand before God in judgment. And if you've, have, if you've not repented of your sins, you've not been justified, there's going to be a long receipt saying you need to pay up for all the sin that you've committed. You're out there fornicating, partying, drinking, cussing, blaspheming, all the stuff you were doing. You thought you were getting away with it, but there was a tab being ran up and the wages are death. The way you pay that off is eternal death and separation from God. But for the Christian, Christ rips up the receipt, pays it in full, justifies you before God and washes you in his blood and gives you his Holy Spirit so that you can live like him, that you are now free to be a slave of righteousness. Why would we, as we close chapter six, why do we keep going back to our old sinful nature? I believe tonight, many of you are gonna be born again. Many of you that proclaim to be Christians, but there's no fruit on your branches. Just like you can identify a, a tree from its fruit, you can identify a person by their actions, but tonight, God is going to regenerate you. You're gonna be born again. You're gonna have that experience with God and there's gonna be fruit produced. I, I really think we need to stop declaring people saved right away. Oh, you're saved. Oh, you're saved when there's no evidence or fruit. How could you tell a tree? You plant the seed, which is the gospel. You need to wait until the tree grows to be able to say if the person has good roots or not, if they're really a Christian and you identify that they're a Christian by their actions. That's what the Bible says, John 7, Matthew 15. You have to actually have, there has to be some evidence there in their life. Yet we get people to the altar say, oh, you're saved. And the tree never grows and the fruit never produces. And the Bible says those branches get cut off and thrown in the fire. I think we need to stop saying, you're saved immediately and start doing what the Bible says. Once the tr the seed is planted, let's see if it's the rocky soil. Let's see if the devil comes and steals it as the bird. The book of Luke talks about. Let's see if it's on um, thorny soil where the thistles and thorns come and choke it out. Or let's see if it's a good soil. And if it's those other three, then you can't say you're a Christian because there's no fruit. The fourth one the tree grows, and then once we see the tree, we go, oh, they're a Christian. That's how they did in the Bible. They didn't ever say, oh, pray the prayer, and you're now a Christian. They would see there's fruit, and then they go, oh, those people are Christians because there's actual fruit in their life. Let us pray tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on that cross. We thank you, Lord, that we couldn't do it, that we were not righteous, that we were not good enough, that we were unclean, and that, Christ, you died for us. And, Father, I pray tonight that many people listening would repent of their sins, that tonight we declare that we are, come on, say this, we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness, that we are crucifying our flesh, that our flesh has been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ living in me. We give up the old desires, Father. We're asking you that we would be born again, a new creature, a new creation in Christ, and that we'd walk in holiness, that we'd no longer walk in sin, we no longer walk in death, we no longer walk in the power of sin, but that we would be born again tonight in Jesus' name, that you are a new creature, that you sin no longer. Hear me tonight. Sin no longer has dominion over you in Jesus' name. You don't have to keep sinning. You don't have to keep going back to that thing. You don't have to live your life angry. You don't have to live your life with unforgiveness. You don't have to live your life addicted and going to lust and pornography and, and the club and the bar. But God says now you can be free and you can walk into righteousness and there's deliverance available, there's freedom available and the Holy Spirit will regenerate you. You'll become a new creature. Sin no longer has dominion in Jesus' name. Father, I pray have your way tonight, Lord. Touch minds, touch hearts. Do what only you can do, Father. We ask you in Jesus' name to do what only you can do. That only by your spirit and only by your power only by the grace of God. We thank you tonight, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that we are baptized in Christ. We are baptized in his death and we are baptized in his resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Father, do what only you can do tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Do what only you can do. 
anoint us, God. Baptize us in your Holy Spirit and fire. Touch those that are weary, those that want to give up. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them tonight in Jesus' name. Fill them tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, baptize us in fire. Give us a new desire. Give us a new nature. Give us a new hunger. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing us and washing us in the blood of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. I'm telling you guys, I believe tonight God is giving many of you a new nature. He's giving you new desires. He's giving you new ambitions and new dreams. Um, we have to do this, guys. We cannot live our life slaves to sin, walking around going, oh, we're always going to be defeated. We're always going to be in sin. God desires to cleanse us, to wash us, to renew us. So I'm telling you guys right now, today is the day of salvation. Now is the day to say I'm no longer presenting my body to unrighteousness, but I'm presenting my body to God as a living sacrifice. If you are blessed by tonight, pray about sowing into the broadcast. Again, guys, I have a lot of stuff I have to get done tonight. I got to record. I got to get a lot of files done. I got to get stuff finished packed. I have a lot to go over before I leave tomorrow. All of my family's already gone. Um, my extended family's already gone on vacation. They all left today. And I wanted to stay again another day to be able to do this broadcast for you guys. I'm going to meet up with them tomorrow morning. But these are sacrifices we have to make, okay? I know you're like, oh, you could have just went and canceled. I know, guys, but they're sacrifices we need to make. We're a community. God is training us. God is equipping us. God is raising us up. I believe this word is going to bear much fruit. I don't feel, I don't believe that I'm wasting my time preparing these messages, teaching you guys for you guys to say, oh, that's good, but never live it out. Like more than giving to the broadcast or sowing or letting giving so we can keep going, do what I'm saying to do. Do what the, let me say that again. Do what the Bible says to do. Obey the word of God. Don't just hear these preachings and go, oh, that was good another hour-long message guys it takes me so much time to pray and prepare and study and God give me these words please let it fall on good ground okay please let it fall on good ground because I want to see you succeed I love every single one of you I want to see you grow I'm not doing this for an income I'm doing this for the outcome of seeing people raised up and the power of God moving and the kingdom of God advancing in the earth so I do love every single one of you all of you giving Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you monthly partners. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Zell, the Venmos, I see every single donation. I go through every single one. I read every single message on these donations, and I thank you guys tremendously. I can't say it enough, guys. I really appreciate it. My allergies are wild today. My throat literally feels like there's a knife in it. I don't know what is going on with my throat here today. Be doers, thank you. And all the happy birthdays, thank you. And the birthday donations, thank you. It's not required, it's appreciated. But I do appreciate all of you guys giving, saying happy birthday. Um, yes, I love you guys. We're family. We are family. I'm going to hang out and read the chat for a bit. I'll read probably the donations off stream tonight. Again, guys, I have a lot of stuff I got to get done. It's been a really long day. We have a lot going on. And so I don't know if I'll be on here for two hours. I promise, guys, next week when I get back, I'll spend more time with you guys. I'll stay longer. I know I've been cutting out... For me, it's early, even though it's an hour still, or an hour and 15, 20 minutes, whatever. But usually, I never go under two hours um, with hanging out and talking to the chat. So, we will do that. Yes. So, we will do that soon. But those of you that are here, thank you guys. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Those of you that are with us for our verse-by-verse -verse teachings, I know they don't get the most views. I know they're not the most, oh, man, everyone's here and, you know, whatever. But we will do be doing more topical teachings mixed in. Yes, but God is good. Happy birthday, thank you. Where are you camping at? Uh, I don't want to say because I, I, there's too many weird people that watch and I don't want to end up being camping and then all of a sudden people that have ill intent show up. So I try not to leak where I live or where I'm going and stuff like that just because I love you guys and a lot of you guys love me, but there's a lot of people watching online that don't like me and there's a lot of people that aren't Christian. There's a lot of people that are just ill intent intentions. And so, uh, yeah, not a good idea to be at the campsite and then have people who have ill intentions roll up and that would not be a good thing. Hey man, thank you guys for all the happy birthdays. I know I'm 31 for those of you that are asking. I know I'm an old man. What are we going to do here? I'm getting old. What can I say? 